Good morning, everyone. Good morning. How many of you all know that he's able? Amen. 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 So I'm gonna, I want y'all's help on this. Okay. So how I like to say, get in where you fit in. Okay. Amen. Thanks for having me today.
It is a brisk morning, but it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Because so many were not able to be here with us this morning. But I want to thank you and you and you and you and you and you for coming and being with us in person this morning. And for those who are worshiping with us virtually, it's time to come on back. Because we have plenty good space and plenty good room. Yes. So we're glad that all of you are worshiping with us this morning. So we're just glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And I'd like to thank our guest soloist, Miss Allen, this morning for providing us with music this morning. We thank you, Miss Allen, for that beautiful selection. And we know there's more to come. <laughs> Psalms 133 and 1 says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren and sisters to dwell together in unity. And that's what we are doing this morning. And I would also like to uh, give a uh, accolades to our guest speaker this morning, Dr. Valerie Sanders. Saunders. Sanders. 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 Want to get it right. Dr. Uh, Reverend Sanders for being here with us this morning as well in the absence of our pastor, Reverend Dr. Michael Stinson. Would you please go with me as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning? Dear God, thank you for your amazing power and the work in our lives. Thank you for your goodness and your blessings over all of us. Thank you that you are able to bring hope through even the toughest of times, strengthening us for your purpose. Thank you for your great love and your great care, because God, you didn't have to do it, but you did. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. Thank you that you are always with us, regardless of where we are, and you will never leave us. Thank you for your incredible sacrifice so that we might have freedom and life. Forgive us when we don't thank you enough because we don't take you for granted. We're just not, we just don't say thank you enough, but our intentions are good, dear Lord. We thank you for who you are and for all that you do and for all that you've given us. Help us to set our eyes and our hearts on you afresh. Renew our spirits. Fill us with your peace and your joy. We love you and we need you this day and every day. We give you all the praise and all the thanks for all for you alone are worthy to be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. As we move forward throughout our program this morning, I hope that I introduce myself, and please forgive me if I did not. My name is Ernestine Sumlin, and I am one of the worship assistants this morning who will be assisting in worship. So I'm glad to see that you are here and I am here and we're just one great big happy family this morning. So I know some of you have on masks and some of you don't. So for those who you don't have on masks, I hope you will find something and a blessing throughout this day's service. The announcements for the morning are as follows. Our adult spiritual enrichment Bible study classes are held on Tuesday evening at 6.30 p.m. and on Wednesday at 12 noon. And our children's Bible study is held on Friday evening at 6.30. And all of these Bible studies are held via Zoom. The United Women in Faith will have our quarterly chat and chew which will be held Saturday, March 25th, that's next Saturday at one o'clock in the library. 
The deadline to RSVP is March 21st. Please contact myself, Ernestine Sumlin, or Lydia Miller to make your reservations. As part of our Women's History Month celebration, we will feature a one-woman show featuring Janine Hammond. And Janine's program title is The Journey. And that program will start at 2.30 on next Saturday here in the Fellowship Hall. So I hope that you will all come out and see this wonderful performance that Ms. Hammond has in store for us, and that is next Saturday. The next feasibility, feasibility study discussion will be held on Tuesday, March 28th at, from 5 until 6.30 p.m. via Zoom as well. It is time to order Easter lilies. The cost of the lilies is $15 each. They can be given in honor of or in memory of someone special. The deadline to order our Easter lilies is March 31st. Please make your checks payable to EPFM United Methodist Church and the forms for the Easter lilies will be available on next Sunday. Please don't forget, we are still looking for you to place an order on for our Terry Lynn fundraiser. I know you see these little green cards around here, and some of you say, oh, I'm so tired of seeing these cards. But you know, <laughs> we are still doing our fundraiser, and Terry Lynn, believe me, has some good products, believe me. They're probably not what we need, but, they, but we can order nuts, chocolates, and other tasty items. And some of our members, I mean, they just really love them because they've placed two or three orders already. So, <laughs> so if you haven't done so, Please consider ordering something from Terry Lynn, and you can direct, go directly to the church's website, which is www.epfmumc.terrylynn.com to place your order and pay for it online, and then the church gets a portion of those proceeds from those sales. So please think about, you know, Easter's not far away, so you can get some goodies and some treats for Easter. If you order them through Cherry Lynn, you won't have to go to Walmart or Target or wherever you need to go to pick up all the good stuff over there. But then if you buy from Cherry Lynn, the church gets a portion of it. <laughs> oh, one other thing. Please don't forget, it's tax time to file your income tax if you haven't done so already. The tax deadline is April 18th, so please don't forget, you've got about a month to do your taxes, so please don't forget for those of you who file income taxes to please go ahead and do that ASAP. Our pastor is on vacation, and he will be on vacation from March 19th through the 25th. Let us not forget those who are on our sick and shut-in list, those who are homebound, some are in nursing homes and in hospitals. Let's send them a card, give them a phone call, or if they are accepting visitors, please go by and see them. Because you know, some of our elderly members are alone and they don't get to have much communication outside of their four walls. So a phone call or a card or a visit is always helpful because you never know what they're going through and what we may be going through later on in life. So please think about those who are in those facilities. And one person that I would ask that you continue to lift up today, and I know this is something that we don't normally do every Sunday, is please continue to lift, lift up Crystal McGuire. Yes. As far as I know, Crystal is still in the hospital. She had a little setback as of last Monday, so things aren't go weren't going quite as well as they thought they would be at this point. But continue to pray for Crystal. She, she's gone through a lot, and we never know until you go through something like that yourself what they may be going through. So continue to pray for her. And I also want to say, if Crystal is able to listen on her iPhone, today is Crystal's birthday. Today is Christmas birthday. 
So, Krista, we say happy birthday from your EPFM family, and we continue to pray for you and bless you and hope that you will have a much speedier recovery. We thank you for all that you do for your church. And that concludes my announcements for the morning, and I will turn it over to the next worship assistant at this point. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, East Point First Malibu. Those watching online and those present with us, we want to thank you all for um, coming. You know, it's kind of brisk and cold, but we appreciate your you know, presence here today. I am Shanika Allen. Um, as I um, recite our East Point vision statement, I ask that you all join me. Our East Point First. East Point First Malibu UMC vision statement is to be the light of Christ spiritually, physically, and relationally in the city of East Point and beyond. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. I got to bear with me because I don't be like, you know, public speaking a lot. So, you know, it's breaking the ice. But I'm getting there. I'm warming up. <laughs> Thank you all for that. Um, here at EPFM, we recognize how important it is to help others and to give to one another and to the church. So here we offer seven ways to give. Our first way to give is through our website and that is www.epfmumc.org. Also, you can text to give. Our phone number will be 404-567-5052. We also have, for those people who are social media savvy or savvy through the internet, we have our Vanco Faith app, that is, um, if you have like Google, you can go to your Google's Play Store, or if you have an iPhone, you can go to the Apple Store and it's available to you. We also offer um, offerings through our church's mail slot that is here at 2651 Church Street, East Point, Georgia, 30344. You can also send through the mail, but please do not put any cash through the mail. Um, if you have, of course, a bank account, you can um, offer that as well. And also here in person, that's our seventh way through our receptacles that are at each door and, you know, each corner of our fellowship hall. And as we conclude the seven ways to give, I want to um, offer a prayer for that. So thank you so much for those who were able to participate with that and let us come together and bow our heads. This is when I feel the best, when I talk to the Lord. So. Okay, it's going to be easy breezy. Lord, in this moment, you have blessed us with such love and goodness, and we thank you. We thank you for being an abundance, God. And out of your grace and your mercy and your love for us, we give you this offering today. With it, we worship you, and we give not only our finances, but we also give our whole self to you. Please take it now and use it for your glory, God, for your kingdom. And extend it and multiply its reach and influence as we pray. And bring us closer together to feel more at peace and whole when we are, you know, taken from one place and given to another. So I just want to say that in Jesus' name we pray and we thank you all. And thank you, God. Amen. Amen.
talk about this month. It could go on and on and on. We could start in January and go to next January 2025. Right. But anyway, this morning as part of our Women's History Month moment, I wanted to lift up some, some of you have heard of her and some of you may not. In 1984, Leontine Turpo Kelly was the first African-American woman elected as bishop in the United Methodist Church and the second woman who served at, as bishop at that time. That's a large, great big accomplishment back in 1984. As Bishop Kelly, as bishop, she was assigned to head the denomination's Western jurisdiction which included California and Nevada. Bishop Kelly was born in Washington DC in 1920 but grew up with her family in Cincinnati, Ohio where her father served a four-year term in the Ohio legislature. Her mother established the Urban League in Cincinnati. Her father and uncles were ministers in the Methodist Church and eventually, Leotine also married a Methodist minister, James David Kelly. She trained as a teacher. She taught history and social studies in public schools. Although she was a wife and mother of four, she also trained to become a lay speaker in the United Methodist Church. However, she was called into, into a full-time ministry in 1969 when her husband passed away. In an unusual move, the members of the congregation that her husband was serving in Richmond, Virginia, asked Miss Kelly to remain as their church minister. She did, and that began her trek to many levels of achievement and accomplishments in the United Methodist Church. She obtained her Master of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, and she was ordained as a deacon in 1971 and became an elder of the church in 1977 in the Virginia Conference. Bishop Kelly was an extremely active and activist member of the church, well respected and much loved. While serving as presiding bishop of the National Conference, African University was proposed and adopted as a resolution to establish the first United Methodist University on the continent of Africa. As a founding member of Africa University, she also donated funds to endow two scholarships at the university. Bishop Kelly was also known to be a great preacher as well as an exceptional administrative and clergy leader. In 2000, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. Following her retirement, she continued living in California until her death at the age of 92 Amen. in Oakland, California Hallelujah. in June of 2012. So let us continue to honor and uplift and remember Bishop Leotine Kelly. Thank you. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. 
I am Jack Willard McMichael, and I will be reading the scripture at this time. And I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, Esther, the fourth chapter, first through fifth verses. If you can stand, will you please do so? When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went through the city, wailing with a loud and bitter cry. Mm -hmm. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. Mm -hmm. In every province, wherever the king's command and his decree came. There was great mourning among the Jews, mm -hmm. with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and most of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. Mm -hmm. When Esther's maids and her eunuchs came and told her the queen was deeply distressed, she sent garments to clothe Mordecai, mm -hmm. so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther came for Hathor, and one of the uh, king's enoughs, who had been appointed to attend her, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what was happening and why. I read to you the, uh, from Esther 4, 1st and 5th uh, verses, and Thank you so much for listening. You may be seated. At this time, we will bow in reverence for prayer. Let's set our hearts and minds toward the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, again we come to you thanking and praising you for another day of thanksgiving, Amen. another day of celebration, mm -hmm. and another day of illumination within our hearts. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray that our day of giving thanks is valid, our way of giving thanks is valid, mm -hmm. as long as it is within your name. Mm -hmm. Dear God, help us to spread the joy that you give to us through our children, grandchildren, and the children of our community and the world. Lord, just help us to be a beacon for them and to each other so that they and we as adults can grow more into your likeness of belief. Belief that will enable them and us to solve problems without violence solve our own inner problems of hurt and cope with problems of this world. Dear God, our teaching of your word says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Amen. But that seems to have been forgotten in many instances. Well. But Lord, please instill in our hearts that we need to re-emphasize this scripture to revamp our way of getting along. Lord, our prayer today is to revitalize our souls, our minds, and actions towards one another, and live peacefully from day to day. All these blessings we ask and pray in your name. Amen. Amen. And thank you. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. EPFM and guests. Good morning. And the 
Facebook family and live streaming. I have several things that, oh, first let me say, I am Patricia Stinson. <laughs> I know Miss Bonita will be talking. <laughs> I have uh, two things to say before we, uh, I introduce the speaker. Crystal McGuire is at home. She was one of the first ones when I came to EPFM. She's a jokester. She's um, a giving person. So please take time to send her a card to uplift her. Amen. to be healed again back to her healthy self. Amen. Greetings from Reverend Stinson, who is in Oakland, California. Uh, Ernestine said previously he's on vacation. But I want you all to also lift him up in prayer. Amen. He's in Oakland today to eulogize his, one of his best friends uh, and to tell him he'll see him later. And that is Mr. Dr. Dirk Smith. So lift him up. So now back to my job that I was given today, because I'm supposed to be on vacation too. But I came out of vacation to introduce. I have the privilege of introducing Val. I know her as Val, a friend, a sister in Christ to me. I met her before I met my husband and her husband via a, a friend's, a good friend's son's funeral who passed in 2006 at Turner Chapel. My thought was, and I always say when I have to introduce a speaker, I'm not going to read the bio. But this bio is so good. <laughs> and I was so happy when I saw the program that you all can't read the bio at your leisure, so you're going to have to listen to me this morning. So now I will introduce you to the speaker for the day. Reverend Dr. Valerie Sanders is an ordained interim elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, graduate of Florida A&M University and Howard University School of Divinity. Amen. She served, I'm gonna give you a chance to say hey, some green you. and uh, orange uh, out there you can cheer. She served the congregation of Turner Chapel AME Church for 10 years as the congregational care pastor. During that time, she pursued her doctorate of ministry degree in pastoral care and counseling for Col from Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia, and became a licensed marriage therapist, family therapist. Dr. Sanders worked to establish the Care and Counseling Center of Turner Chapel, which continues to provide counseling service to members of the congregation, as well as members of the greater Marietta community. Dr. Sanders, of many, currently serves as a clinical chaplain with the Atlanta VA healthcare system. In her role, she provides spiritual care to veterans who are living with PTSD and struggle with moral inju injury. Dr. Sanders also facilitates spirituality support groups for several clinics and facilitates marriage enrichment retreats. Listen, Dr. Sanders was also instrumental in establishing a marriage counseling clinic for veterans and their spouses throughout the Atlanta VA healthcare system. In 2020, Dr. Sanders was selected to serve as an instructor with the VA Department of Defense, listen, Vanderbilt Divinity Schools, Integrative Mental Health Divinity Ministry Program. Dr. Sanders is inspired by the witness of Harriet Tubman and understands that her call is to, is to companion God's people from a place of bondage and oppression to a place of freedom. Can I say that again? Yeah. <laughs> Sanders, inspired by the witness of Harriet Tubman and understands her call to companion, to companion God's people from a place of bondage to freedom. Her ministry is informed by the Roman, it's informed by Romans 8:19. The four loves of her life, 
Dr. Sanders is married to the Reverend Dr. M. Lavelle Sanders, pastor of Stock Stock Bridge First United Methodist Church, and they are the proud parents of three energetic children, Nia, Caleb, and Camille. Amen. With all of this, she is a dedicated mother, and she's always there for her kids. And the next voice you would hear after the music select selection is Dr. Valerie Sanders, friend, sister in Christ. Thank you.
so much for your ministry on this day. Yes. To be reminded that none of us know the cause. Yes. 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 None of us. Thank you. It is good to be with you on today. It is good to be in worship with you in community in this house of faith. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be in this place. I feel the warmth of each of you, the warmth of this branch of Zion. I'm grateful, grateful for the invitation from Dr. Stinson, grateful that my friend Pat not on vacation, at least for an hour or so. Um, hopefully you can return to vacation in just a few minutes. Appreciate your sacrifice. Amen, amen. Uh, I won't be before you long, uh, and those of you who've been in church all your life know that that's cold word. Well. That it may be a while, but for me, <laughs> I really won't be before you long. Amen. Amen. Oh. It's, it's beautiful when you see the confirmation that God provides. Mm -hmm. And so often in our lives, confirmation is given. God is faithful to give us confirmation. Oftentimes our ears are closed. Our eyes are closed. Our hearts are aren't open to hear the confirmation. But I'm grateful that I was obedient and God led me to, to Esther. And I, I struggled the past couple of weeks. I was like, why Esther? Everybody knows Esther's story. Why Esther? Why Esther? Why Esther for Women's History Month? And I enter this sacred space to hear that the scripture that had been chosen for our hearing on this morning was... Yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so I surrender to God's spirit and God's leading. And I will get to the scripture in, in just a second. My, my, today I would like to pray and give you my sermon title. Let us, let us go to God. God, we thank you for this opportunity for worship. We thank you for the opportunity to hear a word from you. We've felt your presence. We've heard you in song. We've heard you in scripture. Continue, God, to speak to us during the preach moment. Decrease me and increase in me that the words from my mouth will come directly mm -hmm. from your lips. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So today, I was glad to... Uh, to choose a title um, based on this, a book that's on my shelf. So I saw the book, and the book is called My Soul is a Witness. Mm -hmm. My Soul is a Witness. So today, we're going to look at Esther, and we're going to look at this, this understanding that our souls are a witness. Mm -hmm. So there are gospel songs. There's a, there's a gospel song, like an old, old gospel song, 1924, titled My Soul is a Witness. The Paramount Jubilee Singers. Anybody know them? Probably not. Not 1924. Also, then a little later on in 1974, Billy Preston. Billy Preston, anybody? Yeah, maybe yeah. Billy Preston. Wrote a song called My Soul is a Witness. <laughs> My Soul is a Witness was a, also a book that was written um, in 2006. That work provides insight into the spiritual depth and power of African-American spirituals. So it was a book about the spirituals. Then, most recently, in 2003, there was another book titled, My Soul is a Witness. Its subtitle is The Traumatic Afterlife of Lynching by Marie Crabtree. It's an intimate look at the afterlife of lynching through the personal stories of black victims and survivors who live through and beyond its trauma. The author traces the, the long afterlife of lynching in the South mm -hmm. through the traumatic memories that are left in its wake. But the book that's on my shelf is My Soul is a Witness, mm -hmm. African American Women's Spirituality. 2002. 
Now that book is a powerful testament of the importance of spirituality in the lives of African American women. Mm -hmm. Through essays and poetry and prayer and song, women of, African of the African American community celebrate the power of the spirit and their connections through the spirit of God. The book allows us to learn from mothers who bequeath to their daughters the strength from living that comes from deep faith. Mm -hmm. Daughters from whose love for the spirit emerges a love for themselves and their self-worth as human beings. Women whose prayers to the spirit of God release them from the pain and the weight of past betrayals. Mm -hmm. My soul is a witness. My soul mm -hmm. is indeed a witness. Amen. We've witnessed things throughout all of our lives. We've witnessed things. If we think about everything that we've witnessed in our life, there's no way that we can compile all that we have witnessed, all that our eyes have seen. There is no way to capture all that we have witnessed. Even just thinking about recently, we've, we've witnessed, we've all witnessed the election of the first African-American president. Amen. We witnessed and celebrated. We have witnessed life during a pandemic, life after a pandemic, and looking at the implications of all of that. We have witnessed the growth and dependence of technology and the rapid changing of society. We witness, we witness warm days in March that shouldn't be. Yes. Call it global warming or call it climate change, whatever. We've witnessed, Amen. we've witnessed it. We've even witnessed the elevation of the first African-American woman to the Supreme Court, yes. Justice Katanji Brown Jackson from my neighborhood in Miami. I have to add that as a side note. Okay. <laughs> so we celebrate that. We witness the ups and downs, the highs and lows, the pitfalls of social media. Mm -hmm. We've even witnessed an assault on live TV during the Academy Awards. Well, we have witnessed quite a bit mm -hmm. in our lifetime. But let us shift our attention from ourselves just for a moment to, to Esther. And I'll just pick up where Sister McMichael, I'm sorry. Yes, Sister McMichael <laughs> left, <laughs> left off. Um, so Hattag went back and reported to Esther that Morde what Mordecai said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches a king in their inner court, in the inner court, without being summoned by the king, there is only one law, right? That you are put to death. Unless the king extends the golden scepter and spares their life. But 30 days have passed, and I was called. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. This is Mordecai's response. You see, he's outside, sackcloth and ashes. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. Mm -hmm. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. And we know, many, many of us know the story. Many of us know the backstory of Esther and of all of the verses in the book of Esther, that verse that you have come for such a time as this Amen. is the most familiar <laughs> verse. So I became curious about that verse. I became really curious. This is 
oftentimes challenging to preach on familiar texts. Oftentimes it is. When I became curious, I allowed myself to look at it from a different perspective, a different angle. Mm -hmm. So yes, she has been appointed perhaps for such a time as this. So just to give a little bit of the backstory for those who may not know how Esther got to this position of royalty. So uh, the book of Esther opens with, uh, with the king having uh, a party, right? And so it's not about like a party that, not like the party you went to last night. It's not, it's not like that. It was a par they partied for, for weeks and months at a time, right? So party and there's plenty of wine at the party it's like never it's an open bar well it's an open bar oh, i got an amen in the back um, the altar will be open after after the sermon okay so so that so it's an open bar it's a party for months and months and they're all men at the party well all men at this party right so then the king king Xerxes. He was married at that time to Queen, who? Who's the first wife? Vashti, right. Queen Vashti. Married to Vashti. He summons her, right? They've been drinking weeks, months at a time. Him and all the guys. He summons her to come to where they are, to the banquet hall, wearing only her crown. He summoned her to prance herself around unclothed mm -hmm. before all of his guys. Mm -hmm. Right? Amen. Right. And Bash, I said, no, it's not happening. It's not happening. Right? So Bash, disobedient, banished. Right? She could have been put to death because she didn't respond properly to the king's request. But she was just banished. So here, here we are. Poor king needs to find a wife. Right? So he gathers the virgins in Susa. And they all go through a cleansing ritual. It, the scripture says it's like over a year of cleansing so that they can be prepared to go before the king. Long story short, he sees, he sees Esther. Well, first of all, Esther's, Esther's uncle, cousin uncle, Uncle cousin, um, you know how we are when we have older cousins who are more like aunts and uncles. You know, Amen. it, it, it kind of gets lost, messes up family trees sometimes. You just don't really know, is that really my uncle or is this my cousin? What, whatever. Mordecai was Esther's uncle cousin. Okay. Um, and so he let her know. He let her know about the king searching for a searching for a new queen, searching for a bride. He let her know. Now backstory to, to Mordecai. So Mordecai, it is not recorded if Mordecai actually had any children, but Mordecai took Esther in. So Mordecai took Esther in when she was a little girl because she was an orphan. Both Scripture tells us that both of her parents died. We're not told how they died. What happened? What happened to them? We don't, we don't know. But all we know is for sure. The one thing we know for sure is that they are deceased. The second thing we know for sure is that because they were deceased, Mordecai took her in and raised her. So, from this, so looking from this lens of her being an orphan, looking for this, from the lens of her, of Esther experiencing childhood trauma, whatever happened to her parents was not supposed to happen. But Esther experienced the childhood trauma. Esther would have been alone. Esther would have been by herself in the world to be taken advantage of, 
by men, by others, without a family, without a connection, without a father especially, to be that covering for her, to provide that safety for her, she would have been vulnerable to any number of abuses. Mm -hmm. But in the midst of her childhood trauma comes Mordecai. Mordecai steps in and raises her as his own. Mm -hmm. Don't give up on God, because he won't Amen. give up on you. Don't give up on God, because he won't give up on you. How many people know that two things can be true at the same time? Mm -hmm. Esther was an orphan and experienced childhood trauma. Esther was holding trauma at the same time that she was loved mm -hmm. unconditionally by her uncle. Mm -hmm. These two things, these two realities at the same time, mm -hmm. one does not negate the other. And Esther being an orphan is a part of her story. It's a part of her narrative. It's in, it's in the book. It's in the book a couple of times. Mm -hmm. It's in her narrative. I say that because I was talking to... Um, uh, one of my own cousins on yesterday, um, and she was sharing with me about uh, a, a childhood trauma that, that I didn't know about that she had experienced. Mm -hmm. And when she mentioned it, she said, well, I didn't get any help for it because I just got over it. Because I just got over it. She said, I realize everyone can't just get over it, but I got over it. Mm -hmm. And she said it about three times. And so, well, you know, the fact that you're saying it over and over again means you, you haven't gotten over it. And so what, what, what I want us to know, what I want us to understand is that there's no, there's no getting over. There's no getting over. But that's, that's not saying that God isn't with us. Because, again, two things can be true at the same time. But there's no, there's no getting over it. It's a part. Unfortunately, it, speaking yeah. to predominantly African Americans, African Americans, as African Americans, we hold family secrets, right? Yeah. Tell the truth, yeah. shame yeah. the devil. Yeah. We hold family secrets. And those secrets just continue to fester. And we'll say to ourselves, yeah, that happened. But I, I got over I got over it. I got over it. I just... I just move on because I try not to think about it. I try not to think about it. I just move on. That means I'm still, I'm still moving. I'm still moving. God's still faithful. That means I'm all right. But those secrets, those secrets are still with us. Those secrets, those, that trauma is still with us. That doesn't mean that it can't be, that, that doesn't mean that God doesn't use that. What I want us to understand today is that God uses all of our story, the complete story. You know how sometimes we want to read the Bible and just pull out the scripture that we like? <laughs> right? I'm the only one. I'm really, no, no. Okay, you, all right, all right. We pull out the scripture that we like. So even in telling our own story, we pull out the highlights, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like, it's as if we're encountering people and talking through Facebook, right, or Instagram, mm -hmm. and we just pull out the highlights. Do we show our bad days on Instagram? <laughs> Facebook? No. And that's not the way we live. Mm -hmm. We cannot pull out only those stories that feel, only the parts of our narrative that feels good, mm -hmm. that makes us smile that makes us feel loved. We, we have to tell the whole story. The whole story. The word tells us, and we always, we just like the first part of the scripture. The word tells us that we overcome by the blood of the lamb. And we stop there, right? We stop right there. We overcome by the blood of the lamb. And, there's and, there's, that means there's more. And what? The word of our testimony. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word 
of our testimony. Mm -hmm. The word of our testimony. That's what gets lost. The testimony. Mm -hmm. We'll stand and say, God is faithful. I got over it. Mm -hmm. I don't need to talk about it anymore. I got over it. It's done. <laughs> but we drag it everywhere we go. Mm -hmm. It's with us. It's with us. Just if we think of our life as a book, are there pages ripped out? Mm -hmm. It's not complete. We can't do that. There are no pages ripped out. It's all there. Everything. Good, the bad. And the ugly. Yes. <laughs> all, all of that. All of that. So, so if, we, if, we look, if we look at Esther, we look at her story, we look at her truth, her telling, her speaking her own truth, realizing realizing that she was, yes, orphaned and loved and cared for by her uncle Mordecai. Mm -hmm. She experienced both, those, those two things. So I was curious when I was reading the, when I was studying Esther this time, I was just curious about what made her risk her life. Mm -hmm. what, what was it? What was it that made her risk her life? So, so for those who don't know the, the story, there then became, yes, she became queen. So she went from orphan to queen, right? So she went from orphan to the palace, mm -hmm. privileged. Mm -hmm. having, she went from being vulnerable to having power. So then we get this threat on her people. She didn't come, she didn't tell King Xerxes that she was Jewish. That was a that was a little secret. She didn't mention that. So then we get, and it's 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 such a long, rich story. Better than anything on Netflix. So you should when you get home, when you get home this afternoon, get home this afternoon, get some popcorn and read. Read the entire book of Esther. The mm -hmm. twists and turns, all of that. So, so read that. It's, too, it's way too much to talk about right now. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, that, so there's a plan. There's a plot to kill all of the Jews. All because this one guy, Haman, didn't like Jews. Then there's a whole history of that. Mm -hmm. There's a whole history of why he didn't like Jews, because he was connected to the, the first people, the um, Amicalites, who overtook the children of Israel when they came out of exile. So it's, it's a long history. There's generations of hate Amen. for the Jews. Generations. So he's standing in that hate. Mm. And he gets mad with Mordecai, finds out Mordecai's a Jew, gets mad at Mordecai, because Morde Mordecai won't bow to him, right? Mm -hmm. So he's not bowing, he's mad, so yes, we're going to kill Mordecai. Matter of fact, let's just wipe out all of the Jews. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's, a, there's this plot to kill, to kill and destroy because of generational hate. There's a plot to kill all of the Jews. Um, when I think about, I was I was thinking about this generational hate, and I was thinking about some some fairly new ideas that are being tossed around in modern science and psychology, and, and, and this idea of um, it's, it's it's epigenetics. It's a big word. It's a big word. Don't get lost in the word, but. It really, me it really talks about how trauma can be passed down generationally. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Trauma can be passed down generationally. Mm -hmm. And we have these experiences. We live our lives oftentimes based on trauma from our grandparents, mm -hmm. based on trauma of our parents. So, hey, so Haman is carrying this this anger and hatred because of all that he's been taught about the Jewish people, all that he's been told, all that he has witnessed. So his, his, his soul witnessed mm -hmm. 
this generational hatred. But we're not gonna spend time, not gonna spend time with him. We're still talking about Esther, right? And what made Esther say yes? And I would venture to say that, that for Esther, because she knew the stories, because she knew the oppression of her people, because she knew the story of Daniel worshiping one God, being thrown in the lion's den, because she knew of Abraham and Sarah, because she knew of the journey in through the wilderness, because she heard of Moses, because all of this has been shared with her through her life, her community, her uncle, cousin Mordecai. She knew her history. She knew who she was. Even if she was kind of incognito in the king's house, in the king's palace, not really confessing who she was, even though she held that secret, she knew who she was. She knew that even in that moment where Mordecai says, you may be called for such a time as this, that it wasn't about who she was right then. It wasn't about Queen, it wasn't about Queen Esther. It was about the generations before. It was about her realizing that she is living today. She is living in the palace, in the king's, uh, in the king's palace, in the royal palace because of all that had happened throughout the generations. That this was God's ordained plan for her to be in this place. And that one woman would save her people. That one woman would save her people. Just as one man was trying to annihilate all of the Jews, one woman was selected to save her people. This threat of, this threat of genocide, this comes from that long history of hate. And to shift to the powerful beauty of, of the beauty and the richness that we have in the generations of even our lives, if we look back our soul has bore witness. Our soul has bore witness to many strengths of our people. I know I mentioned um, in my bio, I mentioned Harriet Tubman. That's, that's my girl. We're, we're like this, me and, me and Harriet. Um, it, my soul witnesses to all that we have experienced as a, as a people, the struggle. Right, the oppression, the 400 years of legal chattel, chattel slavery, yeah. Jim Crow, black codes, discrimination, yeah. hate, just hate, laws fueled by hate. All of that, my soul bears witness to that. But my soul also bears witness to the overcoming to the strength of our people. Just as Esther leaned on the strength that she had in that moment, she knew that there were people who had gone before her who blazed the trail. She knew the story. She knew the narratives. She knew that she carried all of that with her. That in that moment, it wasn't just her standing. It wasn't just her saving her people. It was all that she knew. It was all that had happened decades and generations and generations and generations before. So even as I stand today, I stand not by myself. I stand in my soul as a witness, not just to struggle, because again, two things can be true at the same time. Yes, our history has some heavy, painful pieces. And even our personal histories may have some hidden, dark, painful places. But that's not the whole entire story. Okay. That's not the whole story. That's not the complete narrative. That is not all that we carry. That does not define us. 
those heavy stories, but they are a part of who we are. Even when, when I was talking with my cousin yesterday and she said she had, she had gotten over it in her next breath, like she said it three times, and she, in her next breath she said, but I think that's probably why I haven't been able to sustain any relationships with men. And she's 60, I believe. So she ties it to, she can identify that it, this thing, has impacted how she's lived our, how she's lived her life. And so for so often there are things, there are issues, there are instances, there are, there are examples of things that should not have happened that happened, decisions that were made that shouldn't have been made, that we carry. We carry with us. And we don't realize how it impacts every decision that we make. So let us find strength in Esther, being able to name her trauma, being able to name that she was an orphan and that there was still more. There was still purpose for her life greater than anything she could have ever imagined. Her willingness to take a stand was not simply a response to, to Mordecai. His teachings, his history, again, her response came from a deeper place. How are we responding today? What challenges, what challenges are we facing? What is before us on today? And how does our soul bear witness? Because our soul is speaking. Our soul speaks. Our soul is connected to God. How does our soul speak to us? So that when you go out tomorrow and you make a decision, is it from that place of victory? Is it from that place of, of overcoming? Or is it from that place of pain? Is it from a place of hurt? How do we respond? What is, our, what is our soul witnessing to each and every day? Our soul is a witness. Our soul is a witness. I think, about, I think about my story. I think about my mother's life, my mother's story, and my grandmother, and my great-grandmother. And I think, wow, I was raised by a single mother. My parents divorced right after Vietnam, right after my father came home from Vietnam. Then married to the vodka bottle. So they divorced. My mom's a single mom, teacher, and, and struggled to make sure we were safe, make sure we had what we needed. And oftentimes I would think about my story and think about her narrative and think about how, how I would only think of the struggle. And then God let me see, hey, there's yeah. more. There's more to the story. She yeah. loved you. She did everything that she could to give you what you needed. She loved you. Yeah. She made sacrifices so that you could be who you are today. Yeah. She loved you, and you carry her with you everywhere you go. So when I think about the, her struggle, I think about my grandmother's struggle, I think about my great-grandmother's struggle, I am reminded I'm reminded that that's not the end of the story. And my soul witnesses, my soul witnesses their love, their dedication, their commitment, not just for their lives at that time. Not just about, uh, Esther wasn't trying to save her own life. Not just about my family saving their own life or doing things for themselves. It was about those to come. It was about preparing the way for others, for other generations to come. So I encourage, I encourage us to so get ready to take my seat. I encourage us to think about those things that we carry and to realize that our soul is bearing witness, not just to one thing. Our soul bears witness to multiple things at the same time. 
and it takes family. It takes family to share, to speak, to talk about those things that aren't talked about. Right. So that generational cycles, generational cycles of dysfunction will not continue. Generational cycles, patterns of relationships will not continue in an unhealthy way. But that we would walk in faith. We would walk in faith understanding that God is with us. God is with us as God was with our ancestors. God is with us in the midst yeah. of difficulties, in the midst of challenges, in the midst of those things we wish had never happened. God is with us. But what do we do with that? What do we do when our soul bears witness? What do we do? So I encourage each of us to think about what your soul bears witness to. To think about it. And to think about it in a way that allows you to do something different. Mm -hmm. to allow, that allows you to find the strength to realize that yes, things happen, but we all are promised that we overcome. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. So don't be afraid to share your testimony for those who come after you. God is faithful to be with each of us. God is faithful. Let us pray. God, it is on, it is on this day, it is on this day that we come before you finding strength in a story that is familiar finding hope in a story that is familiar to us, but finding it in a way that we might not have found it before. So we are, we are grateful, grateful for Esther and how you brought her to us as a witness. Allow us to be strengthened in this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 At this at this time, the doors of the church are are open. The doors of the church are open. If you desire to rededicate your faith, if you desire during this Lenten season to be drawn closer. To God, you may come forward at this time. If you've never made a profession of faith, if you have never confessed Christ as your Savior, you may come at this time. If you also desire prayer, you may come at this time. The doors of the church are open. And Jesus waits. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Amen.
Jesus' name. Amen. 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 